Good morning. Welcome to the First United Methodist Church in Greenfield. I welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. I am Jeanette Streeter and I will be leading worship this morning. Our recently retired Reverend Comstock will be serving communion, uh, assisted by Chris and Kurt. And Kat is, of course, providing our music this morning. Do we have announcements? No announcements. Well, I am. Oh, sure. Come on. Remind everybody on the mutual ministry team we're going to have a meeting after church. Yes. 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 Well, if we have uh, Chris around, she'll make sure we get out. She will. She will. Are there any other announcements? Then, if you are comfortable doing so, please rise for the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Called by Christ, we have Blessed by God's wisdom, we have Amazed by God's love, we gather to worship. Please be seated as we join together in our unison prayer. God of glory and might, speak to us with your wisdom, that we might truly hear you. Display your majesty, that we might truly see you. Transform the chaos of our lives with the clarity of your call that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Now let us take time to confess our personal sins, things that we have done or undone that have come to try and step to put distance between us and God. We are told that nothing on heaven or earth can separate us from God's love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Let us, as forgiven people, share the peace of Christ from our seats. <laughs> Would you please rise if you are comfortable in doing so as we join together in the affirmation of faith, the World Methodist Social Affirmation. We believe in God, creator of the world and of all people, and in Jesus Christ incarnate among us, who died and rose again in the Holy Spirit, present with us to guide us, strengthen and comfort. We believe God help our enemies. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, in each act of self-giving on behalf of others, in the abundance of all of God's gifts, entrusted to us that we may have enough, in all responsibilities use the earth's resources. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace. We confess our sin, individual and collective, by silence or action, through the violation of human dignity based on race, class, age, sex, nation, or faith, through the exploitation of people because of greed and indifference, through the misuse of power and personal, communal, national, and international life, through the search for security by those military and economic forces that threaten human existence, 
through the abuse of technology which endangers the earth and all life upon it. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. We commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ, to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. The kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our Hebrew Bible lesson this morning comes from Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am jealous, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male and female slaves, your livestock, or the alien resident in your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or your male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our epistle lesson this morning is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will rot. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. If you are comfortable doing so, would you please rise for the Gospel lesson, which is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. 
He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 40 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. So here we are on our Lenten journey, our pilgrimage through the season of Lent. Much like the ordinary, everyday people of Israel might have been on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem during the Passover, during Jesus' time. In fact, this time of year, they would have been on their journey to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of Passover. Once there, they would have some very special traditions that they would follow, including worshiping at the temple, making their offering and sacrifices to God. They would have celebrated the Seder meal with their family and friends. These traditions were woven into the very fabric of their identity as the people of God. A devout Jew, if they were able to, would have traveled to Jerusalem three times a year for the festivals of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. It was part of the religious calendar year, much like our liturgical calendar we use today to remember and celebrate God's great power and mercy. We know that during Passover, the Jewish nation remembered and celebrated their flight from Egypt, where they had been oppressed. They specifically remember how the blood of the Passover lamb of God, God recognized that a Jewish family lived in a house and subsequently, the angel of death would pass over that household. While they were in the desert wilderness, God not only gave them the Ten Commandments, but also established the sacrificial system for the Jewish community. There were very specific rules about what was and was not acceptable as a sacrifice. Rules for how the priests were to make the offerings to God on behalf of the people of God. There were five types of basic types of offerings. Burnt offerings to make payment for sin in general. Grain offerings to show honor and respect for God in worship. Peace offerings to express gratitude. Sin offerings to make payment for unintentional sin. That is what restores the right relationship with God. Guilt offerings to make payment for sin against God and others. Though there were different types of offerings, the common thread was that the offerings were to be from the first fruits, the best of what they had to offer, not the leftovers. For example, a lamb a year old without blemish, or the best of the grain. Until the temple was built by King David's son, Simon, the offerings were made at the tabernacle by the priests on behalf of the people. There was no wiggle room. They could not just set up their own little campfires and build an individual or communal uh, altar and make offerings to God. After the temple was built in Jerusalem, that was the only place that the offerings were to be made. And the offerings for the sacrificial system ended when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. The temple was literally the only place those offerings could be made. To make offerings was the main, one of the main reasons for the long, treacherous, dangerous journey through the hot, scorching desert to Jerusalem. We know that God does not make mistakes, and therefore the sacrificial system itself was not flawed, but the humans in charge of running it, much like us, were deeply flawed. 
as are we all. The system was set up to be available to everyone. If you could afford it, you could sacrifice a bull or ox. If not, a lamb or a goat. If you were really pure, poor, a pair of turtle doves was every bit acceptable in the eyes of God as the bull. It was indeed to be your first fruits, the best of what you had. Now, if you were a pilgrim, imagine traveling many miles on foot in the heat of the desert. You had to worry about having enough to eat and drink for the journey. Were there bandits on the road? Would you contract malaria? No matter how perfect or unblemished it was, if you brought with you your sacrifice from your home, by the time you arrived in Jerusalem, it would no longer have been a perfect, unblemished sacrifice. And so people were forced to buy their sacrifice when arriving in the city. Also, common money, that is Roman money, could not be brought into the temple because it had the image of Caesar on it. It was not allowed to the inner parts of the temple. So in order to make their monetary offering to the temple, the money needed to be changed into temple shekels. So what happens to the tourist industry during a huge event? Because there were thousands that would come for this pilgrimage. Like the price of hotel or dinner, when the Super Bowl or the Olympics comes to town, the law of supply and demand kicks in, right? The price of a sacrifice is outrageous, and the exchange rate is through the roof. So now you have this group of poor families that have saved all year to come to Jerusalem. And they can barely afford the sacrifice and the exchange rate that is demanded of them. The salespeople and the money changers are becoming wealthy on the backs of the poor individuals. Which is why at the which was at the time the only way to get right with God or accepted back into the community. The only way was to make your sacrifice. And here are the money changers making this difficult or impossible for the common worshiper. When Jesus arrives on the scene, for he too was in the city to celebrate Passover, he sees what is happening and is consumed with zeal for the house of the Lord. He knows what the sacrificial system is and supposed to be, how the money changers are profiting on the backs of the poor, and at the same time, he is acutely aware of God's ultimate plan to do away with the old sacrificial system and replace it with the new covenant, with his very own blood sacrifice. For the animal of the sacrifice took on the sins of the worshiper, so they would not die, but instead be restored in relationship to God. Jesus knew he was to become the true Passover lamb. His blood shed once and for all. He reveals this in his plan when he says, Destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. It was not understood until after the resurrection that the temple he referred to was his very own body. After Jesus' death and resurrection, the new covenant was established. The covenant we remember and celebrate this morning during communion. We no longer need to go through the money changers and the salespeople to buy a sacrifice to offer at the temple. No, instead, we have total and complete forgiveness through Jesus Christ. We are forgiven and made whole. Our relationship with God is restored and we are made new in Christ. Amen? So that should have been it, right? New life restored in Christ, available to all. Problem solved? Yet somehow through the ages, other things have crept in and taken the place of the money changers. At the time of the Reformation, the church itself took the role on while selling indulgences. Really, it was a way that they 
They told the common person that they could buy the way out of purgatory for their loved ones. What it really did was fund the holy wars on the backs of the common and the most poor. The need for change brought about the Reformation and Protestantism as we know it. So that really, that should have been it, right? First problem fixed, second problem fixed. We approach the throne of God unhindered. However, through the ages, countless things have taken the place of the money changers, greedy salespeople, and indulgent sellers. Individually, in communities of faith, and complete societal structures. And through all of this, through all of this, God has inspired and given us renewal and reformation. The way to the cross cannot be hindered by mere mortals. And yet God uses us mere mortals as instruments of change. So here we are on our Lenten journey, much like the Passover journey of old remembering the great deeds of God and asking for mercy and forgiveness, looking for newness of life. Rather than physically traveling to Jerusalem, most of us are making our journey to the cross through reflection, worship, prayer, and acts of service. Here we come to recognize, as did they, our need for forgiveness of sins, for mercy and for restoration of relationship to God. It is here we recognize the money changers and indulgences that would deter the faithful from seeking restored relationship to God. We need not look far to see broken, the broken and hurting of the world. And we need not look far to see those who profit on the backs of the poor and the marginalized. These systems are the money changers and indulgent sellers of today's society. As individuals, we also have these filling the place of the money changers. That is fear, shame, pain, embarrassment, addiction, loneliness, and excessive busyness, just to mention a few. As a, as a society, we are fighting against fear, ignorance, and injustice at every turn. We have a global pandemic that has taken the lives of thousands and has changed the way we live our lives. Through this, God has sent heroes, not great big superstars like the Super Bowl or the Olympics, but people like you and I who won't stand for injustice who give of ourselves so the poor won't be quite so cold or hungry, who comfort the sick and the dying at the risk of their own health. When you approach the table of God this morning, I invite you to think about those things that might be acting as the money changers and indulgent sellers in our society and in your own personal relationship with God and how you might continue to use, as God might continue to use you as an instrument of peace. After all, Jesus loved you enough to give his very life that you might have forgiveness and a place in the family of God. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite Reverend Comstock to come up for the Great Thanksgiving, which is printed in your bulletins.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to pre preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your Word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and of wine and make them for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in, in final victory and we praise at, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing of the blood of Christ. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory as we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. You may remain seated, seated for the benediction. Blessed by God's wisdom, called by Christ, amazed by God's love.
There's a church in dear old Greenfield that's known throughout the land for its lovely lighted window with its inspiration grand. Many an evening as I passed it, tired from duties of the day, I have felt inspired, uplifted, as I've homeward gone my way. This window shows our Savior with his sheep, carefree and calm, as they know they're safe from harm. In his arms a lamb is carried. We are the sheep and he's our shepherd. As we feed in pastures green, knowing if we only trust him, we may safely on him lean. Jesus tells us in his Bible that he loves us every one, even sparrow, sheep, and mankind, all that grows beneath the sun. Grant that as we view this window, we may strive to better grow and live up to nobler natures as we pass it to and fro. Bless this church and all who enter May its influence expand. Bless the pastor and his family. May we form a mighty band that will spread the gospel's story, further God's work here on earth. For without his Holy Spirit, there is nothing that has worth. Mm -hmm.